Hello all engineers, makers, electronic enthusiasts out there around the globe. Here's the next installment of Lab Talk, the Lab Talk show. Maybe you watched it regularly the last months and yeah, there was another guy sitting next to me, that's Matthias. Um, yeah, where is Matthias? Matthias is young, he took the next step in his career, he went to another company. Matthias, if you watch us now, uh, good luck in your career and many thanks for the hours we spent together. It was really fun. So I'm alone in the studio now in Aachen, um, but I'm not alone in the show. Um, we have uh, two guys joining and yeah, you may know one of them, the guy on the right, that's Brian. Brian, hello. Uh, Brian, you are sitting currently in South Africa. Um, there's winter time, um, and how do, how are you doing? I'm great, thanks, Jens. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. I'm a little bit nervous. I know you are not you are not nervous at all, but <laughs> okay. Um, uh, we all get the nerves for every live show. <laughs> okay, Brian. Um, the uh, viewers know you, um, you um, joined our show I think two times already, but for the ones who do, do not know you, um, maybe you can introduce yourself a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Look, Elektra and I go back a long way, or at least Elektra does in my household, because I bought my first edition in the 90s because I wanted to build some video circuit. I still have that magazine and that uh, that circuit. And as time went by, I started doing some freelance translations from German and Dutch to English for electoral books. And finally landed myself a full-time gig here about a year ago, which I'm enjoying very much. So now I'm on the editorial team of Electoral Magazine English. Yes, and you are responsible for corrections and that the scope proof tool, the famous scope proof tool where we um, make our corrections when the articles come back from the graphics. Uh, <clears throat> you are also checking language and you are writing articles yourself and so on, but you are doing also projects. Um, so maybe we come later to this. Um, the next guy, um, I don't think you will know him, that's Saad Imtiaz. Uh, he's currently sitting in Pakistan, so we span around the world a little bit. Saad, maybe you will say some words about yourself. You joined Electro in, um, I think, a month ago or something. So maybe you can introduce yourself to the people who are watching. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Saad Imtiaz. I'm from uh, Pakistan. My profession that I am a um, mechatronics engineer. And I, uh, in the past, I've been uh, uh, leading a startup company based in the US as a CTO. And before that, I also worked as a freelancer and a, pro a product development engineer uh, where I develop products and prototypes for various uh, companies all around the world. Uh, I also spent some time in uh, the aviation industry as well. Um, so it's nice to be here today. And you also already started to work on articles and projects. We will also come later to this. Um, yes, as always in the show, we have a sponsor. And this time it's TME. Transfer Multisort Electronic, also known as TME, is one of the major global distributors of electronic and electrotechnical components workshop equipment and industrial automation. The company employs over 1,300 people at its headquarters in Poland and subsidiaries in 11 other countries. Team E serves 230,000 customers from over 150 countries and sends 5,000 parcels a day. Among the 600,000 products available, customers will find solutions by over 1,400 manufacturers worldwide. So coming to the first topic we have today, and yeah, it's already here on the table. It's the Electro Circuit Special. 
Uh, last year we called it electro summer circuits. It's now uh, circuit, just circuit special because, yeah, as I said, Brian, for example, he has uh, winter at the moment. Um, we also have people, we also have readers in the southern hemisphere. And yeah, we want to have, uh, we want to have you fun uh, with the projects um, all the year round. So, okay, it's really a special full of circuits and projects for each month of the year. So it's now our circuit special and we have um, 50 plus um, circuits and projects and tips and tricks and so on. Um, that is our first topic. Um, yeah, let's come to the, to the contents. Um, we have uh, many uh, circuits inside um, special um, and as always, more the sw smaller ones, not the most complex ones, so they are easy to build. We have a lot about audio, um, we have a lot of other analog circuitry without a microcontroller, so you have nothing to program. You can just um, switch your soldering iron on and uh, get the components and come to uh, a project. Um, yeah, but not only this, we don't, we just do not have only the printed uh, special, we also have a digital bonus edition um, because we had so many articles and projects. So uh, we will offer you a digital bonus edition and there, yeah, you can see here the table of contents. Um, there are eight, nine, ten extra projects and these projects will be um, free to download the articles um, in the newsletter tomorrow at, on Fridays you will get the link so you can download this digital bonus edition. But okay, that's a lot of uh, theory so to say. Um, we thought it would be a good idea that we free um, present you some of these um, articles. Let us begin with um, Brian and Saad. Maybe Brian, you take the lead and you can uh, talk about some projects you are especially interested in. Yes, indeed. Um, let me just share my window here. With so many circuits, it's, it's often difficult to make a choice. But as I said before, I do kind of like the simpler ones and I'm not as much of an analog guy as some of you. So I like the digital ones, things that can be run by microcontrollers and so on. So I'm sharing my screen with you now, Jens, if you could bring that up. Uh, one of the ones I liked was the large RGB digit. So we've all got these little seven-segment displays that we've worked with in the past. But what if you wanted something bigger for your clock project or your temperature display or both? And our colleagues Clemens Farlands here put together such a project using individually addressable uh, RGB LEDs, so I thought that was pretty cool. I would like to actually try that out. I think this photo might be slightly overexposed, so you, the dark ones don't look as dark as they are in real life, but I think that's uh, that's quite a treat to have a display of that size. Yes, and we also Looking have at other ones. Yeah, we also have a PCB, that's the famous green picture we can see on the left side. So you can... Uh, yes. Yeah, you can order it in the shop and then it's even more easy to build. Yeah, indeed. As I said, my first electoral project, uh, I don't think I would have managed without the board because it was an analog project. If I tried to wire it up myself, I would have ended up with a, a disaster. So it's nice to have a, a circuit board available. And then looking at AI, yeah. this is not so much a project, but it is an investigation into how Chat GPT could be used on Arduino to create code, even if you're not an expert Arduino coder. So I would recommend looking at this if you're beginning with Arduino. You now have an easy way in, thanks to Chat GPT being able to throw these things together just on the fly. It is quite amazing to me. Morse code generator, once again, back to the simple things in life. Um, not a lot of people have useful Morse code anymore. I think even the ham radio licensing uh, tests don't have Morse code as a requirement anymore. But 
but still it's one of the earliest ways that they've had to encode information in the shortest possible um, bits of information. So now we're used to ones and zero, but how about dots and dashes back then? And Rob Van Hest here yeah, put together a nice project that can actually generate the Morse code based on uh, inputs from the other side of the circuit here. You've got a USB to serial adapter, type messages on the computer, and then the Morse code generator turns them into Morse code. So even if you'd like to learn Morse code just for fun, you could say pipe in a, a text ebook and then just listen to it at your required speed as you fall asleep at night and see how well you can do at determining what the thing is actually saying. I know they were legendary in the 1800s and the telegraph. They could really go fast on that. And then finally, back to computers and digital, I like this one. PS2 mouse as a rotary encoder. So I still have PS2 mice. Uh, they kind of went out of fashion almost 20 years ago when USB took over. But these are much simpler to use. They have a little clock and data line. So you can plug them into a microcontroller circuit, as you see happening here. And then the microcontroller circuit can easily, with a little bit of firmware, take that and use whatever the mouse is doing, left, right, up, down, click, and so on, and turn that into something else that you can use. So the author, you had a specific use case, but you can use this as a foundation for other projects that you can use a mouse on. That's exactly why I haven't thrown away my PS2 mice yet, because I have had fun with them in the past, for example, using an X-axis on one servo and a Y-axis on another. And when you move the mouse around, you can actually move a crane a little train made out of Meccano, for example. And yeah, those are my favorite uh, projects. Okay, what has and some... Brian, Brian, do you have a PS2 mouse at home still? Oh, yes, absolutely, at least one. Um, I have to go through the junk drawers and boxes. You don't want to see my hoard of wires and equipment and mice and keyboards. And But yes, I have at least one PS2 mouse, which I did use on an Arduino project once. Yes, I know you are not the one who throw away uh, all this old stuff. You are keeping it and maybe you can tinker around a little bit with it um, some years later. Yeah, as you say... Yeah, uh, when I retire. We don't want... <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, as you say, we don't want to see it. Yeah, we definitely would like to see it. Maybe uh, in one of the ne next lab talks, you will have the chance to present a little bit more of your uh, retro equipment. And you awesome. You I'm also, surrounded by it here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you also uh, mentioned um, a buzzword we, are, we will talk about today, um, artificial intelligence. We will come to that topic later. Um, yeah, then... First to Saad, um, Saad, you also um, had a look in that circuit special. You, it was too early that you collaborated with us on it, but uh, you, you are also a elect regular lector reader and you also took a look and you also find interesting stuff. Indeed, yes. Uh, I personally really like this uh, edition. Uh, it had a, a lot of small circuits as well. Uh, I personally like analog circuits because you can uh, add them into your products or your small projects. Uh, therefore, uh, my selection is uh, small circuits, analog based, uh, which are quite nice. Uh, I am sharing my screen now. Yeah, that's a quite simple circuit, as we like it. Yep. Yeah, so it's a power on-off switch with a push button. Uh, this basically what you can use for is, uh, let's say you have a project, you don't want to turn off with a toggle switch. Uh, you want to make it a little bit of modern, uh, you know, into it. So you can basically use this uh, circuit for, uh, you know, turning your projects on and off. Uh, over here, uh, the triple five uh, timer IC is being used. Uh, it's basically used for small uh, current circuits, but if you really want to, you know, uh, power high, uh, you know, high requirement circuits uh, which require more current, then uh, you can of, of course use a MOSFET uh, for that. 
All right. So second one is uh, reverse polarity protection with drop voltage. So we'll drop voltage. Uh, this is a very important circuit for mm, particularly DC circuits. So if uh, you're powering your circuit with a battery and uh, let's say you uh, accidentally connect the positive to the negative and negative to the positive, uh, we all know uh, we get that smell of uh, uh, no joy, and it just uh, burns your circuit, and you have a very bad time then. So this is a very useful circuit as well, which I find um, very simple. Indeed. Yep. I think... Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I was a problem with the scroll. Um, okay, so uh, the next one I really liked is the eco timer with the auto shutdown. So what it actually does is uh, turns off when it finds out that, hey, uh, there's no power being used uh, by your project. Uh, this has multiple applications, uh, can be used for various uh, things, you know, those power hung hungry circuits. I myself is uh, very conscious about how much power I use. So I really liked uh, the circuit for getting implemented in my projects. After that, finally, the power overload monitor. Uh, this is uh, this is one circuit I actually implemented in my household. So let's say uh, on my power supply, uh, if it takes usually a more current, it automatically trips off um, due to this power load monitor and also beeps that, hey, you're using too much current and too much power, which is, of course, bad. Uh, so uh, these are the circuits I really like the most. OK, cool. Uh, Saad, do you also build uh, stuff uh, yourself? So in the, in the past, you said you were at a startup. But uh, in your yes. spare time, you also made projects, I think. Yes, uh, I am uh, sort of a maker by myself, so I make a lot of projects, uh, basically IoT projects, home automation projects. So let's say my garage do a door is automated, um, my water tank is automated, uh, I am having, I'm having these power monitor uh, ICs and, uh, you know, on the circuit breakers, which tell me how much uh, power I use per room. So that these are some of the projects which I have made in the past. Also, a lot more. I, if I just uh, start naming them, uh, it's gonna be, it's gonna take a lot of time. But these are the few ones I uh, been making. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I also have some favorite projects in the Electro Circuit Special. Um, coming to the first one, that's a THD generator. Um, yeah, you all know the THD measurement devices um, and you know that um, a low THD is always, um, is always um, desirable when you have um, audio projects, amplifiers and so on. Um, this is uh, actually a device which generates the THD uh, distortion on purpose. Um, so what what can you do with it? Um, yeah, you can of course um, test measurement devices or calibrate measurement devices. But also an interesting application is that you um, generate some distortion and um, listen to uh, to the sounds, um, and then you can uh, prove your own ears because yeah. You know the data sheets, the manuals, they are full of uh, numbers um, with very low THD uh, values. And yeah, can you actually hear it? That's a big question. And with that um, generator, you can really test if you could hear the difference, for example, between two amplifiers. Um, yeah, and then I have a second quite nice project that's coming from one of our it Italian authors. Yeah, you can see it's a Christmas ball already. Um, and in that Christmas ball, there is an FM radio. So yeah, you can, um, it's a plastic Christmas ball. You can put the circuit, if you build it inside, then close it and hang it on your tree. I just hope that it will not 
just play uh, Last Christmas from Wham all the time. But <laughs> okay, there is a, um, a capacitor you can uh, you can set the, the frequency of your favorite radio station. Uh, yeah, that's really a, a nice thing. And yeah, we have another interesting article. Um, yeah, that's coming from Brian actually. Yeah, and that will bring us to the next um, topic in our show today, artificial intelligence. Brian, it's the first installment of your series about artificial intelligence. It's the keyword, the buzzword we have at the moment uh, coming from ChatGPT and all these uh, image generation uh, tools we have um, on your, our fingertips. And yeah, we said it would be really a good topic for a series, so you can always report on the latest things playing. Uh, yeah, maybe you can say something yourself on this first installment, um, Brian. Yeah, certainly. So artificial intelligence has been a buzzword for, I don't know, 50, 50 years or more. Uh, this fantasy, especially in science fiction, of robots that could think for themselves and then start to take over. But in reality, we were a little bit far from that. Um, you look at articles from Elector from the 90s, and so you had buzzwords like fuzzy logic, making decisions, and nothing back then that would pass the Turing test. If you know what the Turing test yeah. is, it's that test where you have a conversation with a computer and you determine whether it's human or computer, because you don't know. And if you think it's human, then it, the computer has passed the Turing test. But well, these days, that's a moot point because ChatGPT is doing that so well. And just in the last year or so, uh, the progression has been phenomenal. So I don't even think we can keep up with all the changes even in a, in a monthly magazine series. But it's good that we're embracing that. I've tried a few things with it. In fact, I've tried a lot with it. I'm down to using ChatGPT every day now. But just in this article that you mentioned, I had, for example, a Raspberry Pi and a Pi Maroni uh, device with eight RGB LEDs on it that plugged straight in. And I just bought it because it was there and it was cheap and online and it got delivered and I wanted to try something. So I went to the website and had a look. And it was a long, in-depth documentation, no fault of theirs, but I didn't feel like going through that right at the moment. So I just went to ChatGPT and said, I've got a Pi Maroni and a Raspberry Pi, write me some code that makes a... A Knight Rider running light. If any of you recall Knight Rider, yeah. um, it was this car over here. Yeah. And it had a little, little red light in the front. But we go, wow. So I didn't even mention colors. I just said, make a Knight Rider running light. And it put together some Python code that ran first time and made a red running light on the front. So it was quite astonishing. And now I use it for all kinds of things. I mean, um, I've gotten plumbing tips from it. If I can just... Uh, share my screens here, one of them at least. I seem to have lost my screen. No, that's YouTube. Too maybe many screens I can, open maybe at once. In, the, in the meantime, I can um, um, say something else. Um, yeah, first, um, if you want to reach the circuit special, you can get it at the newsstand sales and yeah, the members um, will automatically ha have it in the post box. Um, yeah, it's interesting. It has, uh, I think, for the first time in electro history, that foldable cover. Um, for the ones uh, who don't have access to uh, one of the newsstand sales, um, you can also order it in our shop, of course. And we have a special present for you. Um, uh, the giveaway of today's show. Um, these interesting PCBs, uh, projects, which are both based on old circuits. It's on the right side, the funny bird, and on the left side, it's the one arm bandit. It, that's actually a kind of game. And yeah, if you are one of the first five people who entered the keyword, in our chat, and the keyword is circuits today, then you will win uh, one of five of these um, boards. You can choose what you like best. So yeah, that was our circuit special um, coming to 
the AI topic again. Yeah, Brian, you may share your screen. Yes, I was just saying, sorry for hijacking the meeting, but I could go on all day about this with the examples. For example, I had here a water outlet pipe in the bathroom that started to leak. Uh -huh. It needed I needed to change the tap. And I was teaching a 10-year-old boy also how to do some plumbing, so we ended up screwing the the tap in skew and ended up stripping that thread. So that was not good news. Uh, after that, I couldn't get the thing to stop leaking. So I could call a plumber, but who did I call? Chat GBT. And I told it at the beginning, you're a plumber with 50 years of experience. And then we started to have a conversation. And I explained the problem and it gave me some advice. And I said, well, it won't be easy to replace the plastic pipe because it's in the wall and we'd have to break the wall apart, as you saw. Yes, replacing the pipe can be and on and on we went. We had a long chat and different types of things and threads and hemp and PTFE tape may not work on a cross thread, I said. You're correct. And on and on we went. And uh, in the end, I got the information I needed, replaced the tap with the appropriate stuff, and, and the bathroom has been bone dry since then. So that worked out for me. Um, I got to learn something, um, and I'm sorry that a plumber may have lost a call-out fee. But that's what yeah, AI is doing to us these yeah, days. That sounds like a very experienced buddy. Uh, you can always ask about certain things. You just give him a phone Exactly. Call. Yeah. That's exactly. Nice. And then every new chat you, that you do, you can start a new chat and it begins a new session. That chat GPT only remembers what's in this session. It doesn't remember if you go to another... Um, session it remembers what you spoke about there so i've got all this history here of other things that i've spoken about for example here i was interested in xbox controller how much of it was analog how much of it was digital and the possibility of bluetooth conversions you know i have a chat about ffmpeg video manipulation and I had this idea that let's say you've got a vertical scrolling arcade game and you want to map the entire level to see what the whole tall level looks like. Well, why not make a video of it and then have ChatGPT tell me how to write an FFmpeg script. I don't know if you're familiar with FFmpeg uh, I know it, yeah. viewers out there, but it's basically a command line thing that can do just about anything with video if you know how to use it. And ChatGPT to the rescue. Okay. It's like, yeah, your frame height, your frame width, let's do this, and then just layer the bottom row of every frame on top of each other and make a giant PNG. And yes, indeed, I was able to make a vertical map out of uh, videos like this. So yes, exciting times and also pretty precarious times that we stop sharing now. Because just like the plumber, I used to do, for example, translation work. It was a specialized skill set. You need to know two languages, and you need to know one of them particularly well. And a lot of that translation work has gone away because uh, AI can do it now with no problem. You just maybe need a little bit of uh, editing of the output language. If you know English, you will, you will know what to do with what, you, what it translated from German. So it's important to keep your skills up to date because you never know. Yes, what's coming yes, next exactly yeah. and that uh, is goes the same goes for all people dealing with graphics because um, as we all know AI tools can also generate images and they uh, do this quite good yeah one example is <laughs> here our cover um, it is actually generated with let's say with help of AI so uh, of course our colleague uh, Harman Haider, he um, edited it, he finalized it, but okay, it's based on an AI-generated image. Um, and Brian, you also have experience with um, AI and image generation, but before we come to that, do we have any questions in, in the chat so far? No, we have a lot of people visiting us and from Sweden, from the USA, from Germany. So thank you, that's, viewers, that's for nice. joining us. <laughs> but if nice. you have any questions, drop them in the chat and, and we'll have yeah. a look. Okay, you have also experience with image generation. So maybe you can tell us something about that because that sh could be also interested for our um, members, readers, uh, viewers of our shows. Um, because, um, yeah, many electronic enthusiasts, they have private 
web pages where they present projects and so on and maybe they want to illustrate that with uh, some AI generated content. Uh, Brian, for example, if I want to uh, um, have um, some components uh, generated, is that also uh, possible or where do you have the best experiences? Well, you know, trying to keep up with all the tools is also difficult, but I've yeah. tried DALI and I've tried Midjourney. Yeah. And I found that Midjourney was a bit better for the type of things we do. And yes, as you said, Summer Circuit Special was the first time we've had assistance with a cover from artificial uh, image generation. But it can't do it alone. So thanks to our great graphics team, we've added a bit and I think made a nice cover. So this is Midjourney that we've got on screen now. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's not fitting your aspect ratio exactly, but yeah, there are some pictures and it does keep a record, so I've got puppies for those people who are interested in that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But the background behind me, I used a bit of Photoshop, but that's mm -hmm. the actual background that you see right there. And then I just put some things on screen like an Elector logo and so on okay. and so forth. Okay. And that was, you know, a, a short prompt and it took a minute to do. Can you imagine how long an illustrator would have taken if you had commissioned that yes. a couple of years yeah. ago? So. Again, there's some more people losing some work. And uh, this was just something I tried to yeah, yeah carry on. Yeah, if I um, want to have, for example, um, yeah, a special kind of, of capacitor or something, is that also possible? It's not very good with components per se. Yeah. So um, I've tried resistors and RCA connectors, and and this is a concept here of a kitchen timer. We did have a project for that recently, yeah, and that's just a rather weird kitchen timer. Um, it's getting there, but it's it's not something you can rely on 100% for schematics or product design or uh, photos of components. It may have a generic idea of what a resistor looks like or a capacitor, but you know you can get those anywhere. If you want something specific, it's going to take a probably some experience in prompt engineering yeah. so then then, then i think you will better photograph yourself or spend some euros for a stock photo if you need some, some absolutely yeah. um, for the moment but who knows yeah. what next week yes. brings because exactly. the field is moving so quickly exactly yeah coming to another ai topic that's code generation and for that yeah we can switch to sart um who um, made a project um, which is AI based and yeah, especially on code generation. Sat, maybe you can say something about this. Sure, yeah. I made a, actually a very simple project uh, based on the ESP32 uh, with uh, a chat GPT. So basically what was going on is that uh, one ESP32 is connected to the chat GPT API and the other one is running on MicroPython. Uh, what uh, the intended goal was to generate code from uh, the chat GPT and then deploying it on the other one, which was running on MicroPython. It, um, setting up the code is not a problem, but making chat GPT write your code for you, which actually works, uh, uh, is, uh, is a big deal uh, in some ways. Uh, so let's say if you ask chat GPT, hey, write me a code to blink a LED five times. Uh, it will generate the code for you in MicroPython, which you can later send it uh, through a server port or Wi-Fi communication. But it says those things in the start. Hey, here's the code for the blinking the LED twice. You have to write the code like this. And those sort of instructions it gives you uh, before and after uh, when you ask for it to code. Um, if you ask it again, hey, don't give me instructions, just give me the code, then probably it's going to give you uh, that. Uh, taking it a little bit step ahead, uh, if you ask for something different, let's say, hey, I have a sensor attached at pin uh, 14, and I want some readings of it and use this, this library, then it gets a little bit puzzled. Uh, you have to really, you know, hold its hand, you know, move on, have the conversation back and forth, and at the end, maybe after five, six minutes, you have a code which you can send uh, to the other microcontroller to, to deploy it. Um, 
overall it was a nice experience uh but uh it has to further move uh in this uh field where you can help get help from a chat gpt but not all get your all code developed for it for deployment Yes, so actually we wanted to make a machine which can program it itself and uh, yeah, you just type in yeah. what the machine should do and it will connect to ChatGPT, ChatGPT will send the code and then the one processor will program or send the code to the other. So you made some steps in that direction, but as you said, there are still hiccups. Um, yeah. You mentioned MicroPython, I think. That is a cool language for that kind of stuff because MicroPython can get interpreted. Um, it's not so easy, of course, with C++ uh, because there you have that compiler step in between. Uh, but did you also um, uh, make experiences with C++ code generation? Yes, indeed. Uh, particularly, um ChatGPT performs really well uh, with developing Python scripts or MicroPython code. Uh, with C++, as you know, that mostly are libraries of Arduino, Expressive, and other uh, you know library makers out there. Uh, they're constantly up getting updated. So let's say if you ask ChatGPT about some code of deploying your code to Firebase, or you know uploading your in the sensor data to Firebase, it will be using an old library and old function parameters. And then you will use that code uh, and uh, use the updated, updated library with it. It will it will not compile. And then you will go back and forth, uh, pasting your co uh, pasting your error in the ch chat of the chat GPT. And then it's going to say, hey, I was using this version. Try that one. So by using dependency feature, you can go back uh, to the library which it was using it is uh, overall it's a great tool for helping uh, you develop fastly uh, your project uh, to get it going uh, but if you want to completely rely on uh, chat GBT, then you know it's not the best tool out there maybe in a few years uh, we will see that it will totally uh, be a game-changing tool and uh, you won't have to code again so, but uh, I like coding myself, so I would, I would don't want to see that, <laughs> but still, uh, it will be a nice thing to see. Okay. Uh, yeah, ChatGPT and code generation, it will um, be featured in, also in future articles, for example, in the November, December edition, where we already started to work on, we will have an article about the Magnetic Levitation Project, you may know uh, from a German author, Peter Neufeld, and he is talking about enhancing that firmware with ChatGPT. Um, Brian, you um, installed a plugin for ChatGPT um, that's uh, called, I think, uh, Code Interpreter. Am I right? So maybe you can say something yes, about that. Uh, Absolutely. Um, Code Interpreter, the name is a bit misleading as a new new fancy uh, concept because ChatGPT, even the free model, has been capable of interpreting code and tells you what it does. I've even found some old code for retro computers, uh, some text file from the 80s, and just copied and pasted into the free version of ChatGPT, and it could tell me it came down to it and explained the whole thing and how the characters were regenerated and told me that it appears to be some sort of city bombing uh, program that was written in German. So I had to try it, I ran it, and yes, that's indeed what exactly what it was. So that's one one meaning of the term interpreting the code, what does it do? But the chat GPT code interpreter actually has a full Python running environment within it, each with different session, it has its own memory, its own virtual disk space, and it can run Python as an interpreted language. So actually run it, see what happens in its environment, and then can help you build on that or create new projects from scratch. So you don't have to have the environment on your own computer necessarily. Of course you should, but whatever you put there in the cloud in ChatGPT, it's going to run there. It's going to have no effect on your environment. So you're 
fully welcome to test whatever you need. And yeah, that is quite a phenomenal step forward as well. You've got a co-programmer sitting, looking over your shoulder, creating code and helping you with your own. That sounds quite cool. Um, yeah, we will um, have following articles about this, this topic, of course. It will keep us busy, uh, I'm sure. Um, what is your, what are your thoughts? What is the direction of AI? Will we also have um, circuit diagrams um, drawing by itself or you say something, okay, I want this project and then it will spit out a complete circuit diagram? I think there are first steps in that direction, but okay, what, what do you think um, we will talk about in maybe one year, Brian? Well, if I could tell you the whole future of AI, I'd be a billionaire, but uh, just the terms of the topics that you're talking about, it's not very good at circuit diagrams right mm. now, but as we said, it keeps growing and surprising us mm. each week, the new things that we didn't expect, and we have tried it, some of us internally on the team, with circuits and interpreting circuits and grading circuits. Not perfect yet, but... A year is a long time. I think we're, a lot is going to be happening within a year. Even if it can't create everything from scratch, it can certainly take a, a novice or a hobbyist or someone typically who might read a little magazine and enable them to prototype and get their own project off the ground from schematic to maybe even board design. Yeah, could be. Sat, what are your thoughts? You are mute, I, I see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, AI yeah, is a great tool. Uh, I have not particularly used it for, uh, you know, designing circuits, uh, but it's actually, it's a really good tool for, let's say, uh, you want to design, uh, you can ask, hey, what's the hierarchy of the system? How will I be communicating uh, to the cloud? Let's say the GCP, Google Cloud sir, platform. Or let's say, how does the AWS work um, platform work? So it can draw, uh, you know, little pictures with the dashes with X key characters, which is uh, it is nice to see. Okay. Uh, but it cannot generate proper graphics, uh, which uh, which can be later on used. So yeah, it is a great learning tool. Um, you can pretty much, uh, if you want to learn anything new, uh, you can just hey, I want to learn about anything you just write there and it just will guide you step by step how to install the software how to do this how to do that so it's incredible i think uh, it's an incredible tool yes and we could talk uh, now for hours i think um, brian you also made experiences with uploading complete uh, books um, and and summarizing it um, yeah, we are a little bit at the end of the time, uh, but that will especially keep us busy also for the ne next lab talks. I think we will have uh, uh, subjects and ideas and, and, and talks about this. Um, so, yeah, it was uh, nice to have you in the show. Um, we see us again uh, in about a month. Um, as always, a small announcement of the next shows. Um, yeah, I think it is the best if you just uh, use these uh, web links, Electro Lab Talk, then you will get informed about the next Electro Lab Talk and the date and the topic. And yeah, of course, Stuart Cording is also um, following his Electro Engineering Insights. Uh, yeah, just uh, go on Electro dash engineering dash insights or you get on electromagazine.com and there you have a um, menu topic about all our shows um, Brian do we have uh, some questions left in the chat well we've got some questions which other AI tool besides chat GPT can be used comes from you flip I can't answer that myself because mm -hmm. I pretty much only use chat GPT I know my daughter likes character AI where she can speak to Harry Potter and all sorts of other characters, but mm -hmm. that's not the kind of tool I'm sure we've asked about. Do you guys use any specific tools other than ChatGPT? 
Sure, I can I can name a few. Uh, they, there's a tool, a free tool called Codium. It's on VS Code. Uh, it's kind of like it also has a chat feature with it, and it al can also help you code. And it uh, will give prompt you. Let's say if you ask a question in the comments, say hey, write, make me a function to check uh, to update my uh, let's say sensor data after five seconds, and it will give you a, a prompt. Hey. Uh, you can use this code options. Uh, you can also chat with it. May, uh, you know, you can comment your code with it. It's called Codium. Uh, there's another very popular tool out there. It's called Copilot by GitHub. It's uh, that's a particular tool I use. Uh, it's it's absolutely amazing uh, in terms of its speed and accuracy. So if uh, you made a function and you're trying to make another function which is similar to it, it would automatically uh, you know give you options. Even if you didn't write a letter, it will say, hey, uh, all of a sudden it gives you the sound and uh, just, just gives you like, let's say, in the gray, it tells you, hey, uh, I'm about to start about this function, writing this function. So it's really nice. Um, I particularly use these two, but there are also other tools out there. Um, uh, Turing is an, another one. I, I, I'm not Turing. I think it's called tab nine. It's also a great tool for uh, code generation, but it's not up the level like Copilot. Um, so, yeah, these are the few I have experiences with. Nice. It sounds like I need to get a lot more experience with some other platforms as well. Um, Asma asks us, would you recommend asking AI tools to complete your code instead of writing it from scratch? Well, um, Yes, I mean, you can start uh, with AI, but you can complete it by yourself, but don't just completely, uh, let's say, rely on AI, because a lot of, uh, it has a long way to go, but it has to, you know, require some human input as well, because uh, as, we as humans have more experience than AI in some uh, places, so it's definitely nice to start your project. Let's say you have a template made from AI, and small th stuff. Uh, maybe you want to write the code in a different way, uh, using a different. Uh, let's say if you want to use a switch case instead of a else if statement, uh, then you can use a, a chat any any AI tool for that. Uh, but definitely just write your code, learn, and then use it as a tool. Yeah, agreed. And I think the from scratch there is key word because. That's typically where I would use it is from the beginning. It's toward the end of getting your script running that you want to finesse it and get it doing exactly what you need it to do. Um, and you can't just rely on it, as you say, to, to be the finished product. You've got to, you've got to have some quality control in there. Yeah, I also think you, yeah. uh, you must know uh, the basics of this programming languages. Then you, maybe you will get surprised what, what ChatGPT or other tools uh, do, and then you can learn, of course. If there is a nice trick in it, uh, you can, you can uh, try it out and, and learn from it. I think the same. It's uh, in that magnetic levitation article. It's it's uh, nicely written about um, both ways. First, uh, ask um, artificial intelligence to write a program from scratch, and the second way also um, to enhance a handwritten um, program. And uh, yeah, there are ChatGPT also made some error, I think, and then. Um, the author uh, said this to ChatGPT, and ChatGPT apologized and um, made an improved program. So, yeah, I think you have to play around a little bit with these AR tools, but I think you should have a little bit knowledge about what, we, what you are doing. Otherwise, it's, um, it's um, not reliable enough. Yeah, indeed. And then we've got a, one more question that's sort of slightly off topic from what we're talking about, but what do you think of ESP32 for projects? Any ideas? Well, first I'll say the plenty of ideas in the Electoral Magazine, so get that. But I like ESP32. It used to be kind of an alternative to some other projects, and they added Arduino IDE support, and now even Arduino has embraced it by putting an ESP32 on, on the board. So. There's a lot you can do with it, uh, as Saad, I'm sure, can tell us. Yeah, 
Uh, actually, uh, when it started, uh, it was the first chip, almost the first chip I knew about. Uh, uh, we had Wi-Fi and Bluetooth uh, enabled, so you can make a lot of IoT projects uh, with it. Uh, pretty much anything you can connect to your phone or uh, in connect to the internet, uh, you can make pretty much anything. Is sky the, the sky is the limit? Uh, of course, uh, Lector has a lot of projects uh, on its lab platform and on also in its magazine. So definitely check those out. Uh, they're quite nice. Uh, so yeah, sky is the limit. I can't you know start naming them. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And yeah. No, there's a lot. One came to mind um, that Xbox. Uh, conversation that I had Xbox controller with the chat GPT well let's say you wanted to run your Xbox controller on your PlayStation console ESP32 might be perfect for that because they use Bluetooth as the protocol so you could have it as sort of a middleman but that's just one idea of thousands yes and we will have another news about uh, ESP32 uh, we will have a special edition which is integrated in the membership at the end of the year which we um, do together with Espressive with a lot of ESP32 projects and I think you will be definitely surprised how many solutions uh, are coming from Espressive. They are not only doing um, semiconductors, they, are, they have more, they have also software and uh, yeah, complete frameworks and so on. Uh, Brian, another question or are we at the end? Uh, no other questions, no. We're pretty much at the end. Okay, then we are in time. And yeah, I wish you a good evening, a good morning, afternoon, wherever you sit in the, in the, in the world. And yeah, watch us again. And a good summer and a good winter. <laughs> yes, watch us again in one month. Bye-bye. Oh, cheers and good to see you. Welcome, Saad.